Today we're going to evaluate this fearsome looking log integral using contour integration. And I previously evaluated this integral using real methods, link in the description, but the solution using complex analysis is a lot nicer. It's much cooler, in fact. So for reference purposes, I'm going to call this integral here i, and the second integral you saw in the thumbnail will be evaluated as a consequence of the solution development to this integral. So yeah, that's the bonus integral for today's contour integration. Okay, that sounds cool. So let's define the complex value function f of z as log z times log z squared plus 1 divided by z squared. And some analysis of this logarithmic term here is required. First up, let's expand it using the properties of the logarithm, and we can do so in the complex realm because we're going to be using one branch of the logarithm later for complex uh, for contour integration anyway. So yeah, it's perfectly valid. So you can expand this as log z plus i plus log z minus i by the factorization of z squared plus 1. And we're dividing this by z squared. Now this complex logarithm being a complex number has a real and imaginary part. The real part being the logarithm of the modulus of whatever complex number you plug into it. So we have log modulus z plus i plus log modulus z minus i for the real part of the other complex logarithm. And again, you can combine them to get a single logarithm of log modulus z plus i times the modulus of z minus i. And if you multiply these two, again, using the properties of complex number multiplication, you get the modulus of z squared minus i squared. And i squared is just negative 1, so let me just tidy things up a bit. And yeah, that looks nice. And the imaginary part is the argument of whatever complex number you plug into the logarithm. So you have i times the sum of those two arguments. So you have the argument of z plus i plus the argument of z minus i. And all of this is being divided by z squared. So that's f of z for you. Before defining the contour, we need to identify any branch points. So you have one branch point because of the log z in the numerator and this z squared in the denominator. And so one branch point here is z equal to 0. And you have another branch point where z squared plus 1 equal to 0 because it's being plugged into a logarithm. So this implies that z squared equals negative 1, which further implies that z equals plus minus i. So you have three branch points to take care of. So here's the complex plane, and we have three branch points. One is at z equal to 0, one is at z equal to negative i, and finally we have one at z equal to i. And here are the branch cuts we're going to use. One is along the negative imaginary axis, and one is along the positive imaginary axis from z equals i upwards. And we're going to be using sort of a semicircular contour. We traverse the negative real axis, skip around the branch point at z equals 0, then make our way along the positive real axis and all the way back using the semicircular arc. But wait, wait, there's a branch cut there. So we draw this straight line parallel to the imaginary axis and this little keyhole around z equals i. Another parallel line, another line parallel to the imaginary axis, and then complete the semicircular arc. Okay, cool. So this is quite an exotic looking contour here, an alien shaped contour, an alien like contour. It does look extremely cool. I think this is the coolest contour we've used so far. So let's name everything now. The radius of the big semicircle is r, so you have negative r here, positive r here. For the little circles, we have the radius epsilon. So here's epsilon, here is epsilon as well. And this here would be i times epsilon. Okay, cool. And we name the arcs as well. So this is gamma sub 1, this is gamma sub 2, this is uppercase gamma sub 1, uppercase gamma sub 2, and let's name these lines as psi sub 1 and psi sub 2. So that's our contour C, and we're interested in the cases of R going to infinity, 
epsilon going to zero. And this gap, let's call it delta, we need delta to approach zero as well. By the way, in case your parents walk in on you watching this, just switch to something that's easier to explain. Anyway, everything's nice and holomorphic for the function and this contour C. So by Cauchy's residue theorem, the integral over the closed contour C evaluates to zero. There are no poles and hence no residues to evaluate. Okay, so that means all the integrals that make up C sum up to zero. And those are quite a few integrals indeed. We have integrals over gammas, lowercase gammas, integrals over upper, uppercase gammas, integrals over straight lines, one from negative r to negative epsilon, another from epsilon to r, and a couple of integrals over lines parallel to the imaginary axis, that's psi sub 1 and psi sub 2. And remember, we're traversing this in the anti-clockwise sense, so that means psi sub 1 is traversed downwards and psi sub 2 is traversed upwards. Okay, and all of this equals zero. So that's like eight integrals to evaluate, which may seem like a lot, but thankfully you can get rid of most of them by virtue of the structure of the function f of z, which was defined as log z times log z squared plus one divided by z squared. So it's pretty easy to verify given that you have this product of logarithmic functions in the numerator and this quadratic monomial in the denominator, that the integrals over gamma sub 1 and gamma sub 2 in the limit as r tends to infinity sort out to 0 because quadratics outgrow or polynomials outgrow logarithms. We're of course speaking in terms of the moduli of complex numbers involved, complex numbers and complex functions involved, that is. Okay, so you can get rid of these two, and similar arguments hold for gamma sub 1 and gamma sub 2 in the limit as epsilon tends to 0, where the argument for gamma sub 1 is pretty trivial. We've evaluated it numerous times on the channel as well. But for gamma sub 2, again, that is pretty much the same argument, but I'll still give you a hint in terms of the parameterization to use if you want to verify this. So on gamma sub 2, which is just a circle centered at z equal to i, any complex number on it can be parameterized as epsilon times e to the i phi plus i. So that's just a circle of radius epsilon centered at the origin being shifted upwards in the complex plane by one unit. And of course the phi variable varies from 0 to 2 pi. So you've gotten rid of four integrals and you only have four integrals left, only four integrals, that's interesting to say. We have two integrals on the real line and two integrals on straight lines parallel to the imaginary axis. Recall earlier in the video, I said something about being careful about these arguments, the arguments of z plus i and z minus i. So what I meant by that was how exactly are these arguments bounded by the branch cuts we've used. So let's talk about the argument of z minus i first up. Well, z minus i reminds me of a circle centered at z equal to i. So if I represent any complex number z by this vector on a circle centered at z equal to i, then we see that the argument in this case will lie between pi by 2 for the positive imaginary axis and one round trip will give us 5 pi by 2 because you have to add 2 pi radians. And what about the argument for z plus i? Oh, terribly sorry about that. Well, in that case, we have a circle centered at z equal to negative i. So for the negative imaginary axis, you'll definitely have an argument of negative pi by 2, and one round trip, 2 pi plus negative pi by 2 gives us 3 pi by 2. With the behavior of the branch cuts sorted out, let's turn our attention towards these integrals first over the real lines. So we have the limit of the integral from epsilon to r as r approaches infinity and epsilon tends to 0.
And this becomes the integral from zero to infinity of log x times log x squared plus one, where we replaced all the z's by x's because we're on the real axis. And this here is, of course, the target integral i. Now, what about the limit of the integral from negative r to negative epsilon as r tends to infinity and epsilon tends to zero? This here is the integral from negative infinity to zero of, again, log x times log x squared plus one divided by x squared dx. Now let's make a transformation from the x realm to the negative x realm. And in that case, I have the integral from zero to infinity. I've switched up the limits to take care of the negative sign of log negative x times log x squared plus one again, divided by x squared. Now what exactly is log negative x? We know that log negative x can be written as log x plus log negative one, negative one being e to the i pi. So this is just i times pi. So this implies that the integral from negative r to negative epsilon in those limits, of course, equals the integral from zero to infinity of log x times log x squared plus one, blah, 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 our target integral that is, plus i times pi times the bonus integral you saw in the thumbnail. So that's the integral from zero to infinity of log x squared plus one divided by x squared dx. And now to evaluate the integrals over the lines parallel to the imaginary axis. First up, let's talk about the integral over psi sub one of log z times log modulus z squared plus one plus i times, what's the argument of z plus i on psi sub one in the limit as delta approaches zero? Well, if you draw vectors emanating from this point here at z equal to negative i, if you use this point as an origin to draw vectors landing on this straight line psi sub one, then we see that as the gap closes, as delta approaches zero, all vectors will just land on the positive imaginary axis. And because z plus i is bound between negative pi by two and three pi by two, the only value it sorts out to in the limit is pi by two. And that happens for both psi sub one and psi sub two because of how argument z plus i is defined here. So we have i times pi by two plus, what about the argument of z minus i? Well, that's where you have to be extra careful. Let me just take this keyhole contour within the semicircular contour and rotate it 90 degrees clockwise. Then this is sort of what I'll get. The blue line being the positive imaginary axis, this upper green line being psi sub one, the lower one being psi sub two, and let's mark out this point here, z equal to i, and use it as an origin for drawing vectors in the complex plane. So any vector on this blue line has an argument of pi by two, obviously, because, well, this is the positive imaginary axis. And if I rotate this in the anti-clockwise sense, and if I just draw a vector on psi sub two, that's a horribly drawn arrow, much better. So if I have this vector on psi sub two, then obviously the argument here is greater than pi by two because I'm rotating anti-clockwise, correct? And that means in the limit as the gap as delta approaches zero, as psi sub two approaches the positive imaginary axis, the argument of z minus i on psi sub two approaches pi by two. Cool, but what about the argument of z minus i on psi sub one in the limit as delta approaches zero? This should approach, well, to get to psi sub one, I have to rotate two pi radians. So if I add two pi to pi by two, I get five pi by two, which is pretty neat. And all of this implies that the integral over psi sub one, for which I've left no space to write, so I'm just gonna write it down here, 
the integral over psi sub 1 of log z times the logarithm of the modulus of z squared plus 1 plus i times we had pi by 2 initially because of the argument of z plus i and on psi sub 1 the argument of z minus i sorts out to 5 pi by 2 and this means we have 3i times pi here divided by z squared dz and what about the integral on psi sub 2 well that's the integral over psi sub 2 of log z times log z squared plus 1 plus i times again pi by 2 because of the rz plus 1 and for psi sub 1 we have wait psi sub 2 for psi sub 2 we have the argument of z minus i approaching pi by 2 okay cool we're dividing by z squared dz and of course this means that you have i times pi again recall we're interested in the limit as delta approaches zero the gap closes so as the gap closes that means you can picture these two anti-parallel lines psi sub one being traversed downwards and psi sub two being traversed upwards you can picture them just overlapping so we'll give a positive sign to the upward traversed psi sub two and a negative sign to psi sub one so introduce a negative sign here and we had to add these integrals remember because of the equation we got because of the residue theorem so adding them up means that you have the integrals over psi sub 1 and psi sub 2 evaluating out to an integral of we see that there's some really nice cancellation here we have log z times i times pi minus 3 i pi gives you a negative 2 i pi divided by z squared dz now let's talk about the parameterization of the integral on the positive imaginary axis well in that case we have z being equal to let's say it's i times a real number t t belonging to this interval from 1 to infinity so that means the differential element dz is i dt and this implies that the integrals over psi sub 1 and psi sub 2 evaluate out to an integral from 1 to infinity of log i t. Uh, we have this negative 2 i pi term times i times dt. So i times i is i squared. Negative i squared is just positive 1. So we can write all of this as positive 2 pi outside however we do have an i squared t squared term in the denominator i squared being negative 1 again we get back to having a negative sign and all that's left is to integrate we have negative 2 pi times the integral from 1 to infinity log i plus log t i is e to the i pi by 2 so that means you have i times pi by 2 here divided by t squared dt and this sorts out to negative 2 pi times the integral from uh, 1 to infinity of 1 by t squared dt times i pi by 2 of course plus the integral from 1 to infinity of log t divided by t squared dt pretty easy to evaluate these two you can verify using elementary integration techniques that the right hand side sorts out to negative 2 pi times this integral which is 1 and the imaginary part of the right hand side is 2 pi times i pi by 2 that would be a negative i pi squared times this integral which also sorts out to 1 so that's what you get when you add the integrals over psi sub 1 and psi sub 2 and now everything everything that we need for the final solution has been worked out and it's just time to piece everything together so let's go back to that horrible equation that had eight integrals four of them canceling out to zero we remember that this integral here sorted out to the target integral i plus i times pi times a bonus integral i sub one this integral sorted out to, again, the target integral i, and these two sorted out to 
negative 2 pi minus i pi squared. The right hand side is a 0, so let's just write this as 2 pi plus i times pi squared. So this implies that i equals the real part, which is pi, and i sub 1 equals the imaginary part, which is also pi. That was awesome, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.